A graduate of Yale Law School, our guest today grew up poor in the midst of the dysfunctional culture of Appalachia. I believe we hillbillies are the toughest goddamn people on this earth, he writes in his new memoir, but we hillbillies must wake the hell up. Today on Uncommon Knowledge, J.D. Vance and his hillbilly elegy. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. J.D. Vance grew up in the Rust Belt city of Middleton, Ohio, and the Appalachian town of Jackson, Kentucky, raised for the most part by his grandmother, Mama. Did I pronounce that correctly? That's right. His grandmother, Mama, whom he credits with saving his life. We will come to that. After high school, Mr. Vance enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and served in Iraq. He then graduated from Ohio State University and Yale Law School. Now a principal with the Silicon Valley investment firm of Mithril Capital Management, Mr. Vance is the author of Hillbilly Elegy, a memoir of a family and culture in crisis. J.D. Vance, welcome. Thank you for having me. Your grandmother, Mama, once told your grandfather, Papa, that if he ever came home drunk again, she'd kill him. He did, and she almost did. Tell us that story. Yeah, that's right. So she, when he came home drunk, he passed out on the couch. And my grandma was not one for sort of taking things lying down. So she decided she was going to honor her word. And she poured gasoline on him, as I write in the book, and lit a match to him. And he sort of, you know, a part of him caught on fire. And it was my aunt, who at the time was 11 or 12 years old, who sort of leapt into action and saved him from uh, you know, potentially burning to death. It's, it's funny, or maybe just morbid, but I think a little bit of both, that when I was talking about this story with family later, um, you know, someone said, you know, J.D., I think maybe you didn't get that story quite right. And I think, oh, no, you know, what, what detail have I messed up that I put in the book? And they said, I think that it was lighter fluid, not gasoline. And <laughs> so there's some, some debate about what the actual substance was, but I think it you know, goes to show, one, that the, the house that my grandparents built after they moved from Appalachia to Southern Ohio was pretty chaotic. And second, that they were, they were pretty extraordinary people in their own way. Okay, so that's your family. We'll come back to your family. Let's talk about the people a little bit more generally from Hillbilly Elegy. I do not identify with the wasps of the Northeast. Sure. Instead, I identify with the millions of working class white Americans of Scots Irish descent. Okay, quick history lesson, make it this big. Who are the Scots Irish? When did they come to this country? What makes them distinctive? Yeah, so Scots-Irish is a bit of a misnomer because it's the Scots, the Irish, but also people who tended to come from the northern parts of England who, you know, so basically rural people who came from the broad UK. They tended to settle in the United States in the 17th and 18th centuries, and they, they tended to cluster along the Appalachian Mountains, so Western Virginia, what we now know as West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, um, you know, Southern Ohio. I, you know, I don't have a fantastic argument for why they clustered in those regions. I mean, some people have argued that they were drawn to the mountains of Appalachia in the same way that they were drawn, you know, to sort right. of the mountains back in the Highland. Um, but they were a very distinctive subculture. And what's relatively, you know, interesting, if, if you look at the ethnography of these areas, they still are very heavily overrepresented in these parts of the country. So even though there's been a lot of assimilation, a lot of dispersion, there's still a disproportionate share of the Scots-Irish in Appalachia. And the important point is that these people who now live in Appalachia and have spread out, as you, as you said, again, we'll come to the, your story about moving from sure. Kentucky to Ohio, they come to this country in the 18th, late 17th, mid, early mid 18th century when the borderlands of England and Scotland and when Ireland are still very rough, violent places. Correct. And they bring with them a, cert, a certain, um, they take a certain level of violence for granted. It's part of their lives. And they also, family plays in those regions as opposed to southern England, which is much more settled and becomes wealthier and more frankly, I suppose the term would be more civilized much earlier, in those reason, regions much more is based on clan. Family has a different weight 
among these people. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, whatever the causes, there is a lot of evidence that suggests that the Scots-Irish valued honor and family loyalty in a very, very personal and deep way. And because of it, they weren't totally afraid to enforce that family honor code in a way that sometimes led to violence. And so you look at these areas, they tend to be much more violent than similarly situated demographic areas. And to this very day. To this very day. And again, the, the cause is something that's interesting that I don't have a great insight on, but it's, it's just there. You know, whether they brought it from the old country, whether it's something they developed after they landed, but there's definitely a very clear sense in which, one, the extended f kinship of family is very, very important to these people, uh, but also that they suffer disproportionate rates of violence, not just violence against others, but also violence inside the home, which is something I obviously write about. And one more characteristic of the Scots-Irish, of your people, so to speak, as a whole, before we move on. You mentioned tended to settle in Appalachia. You name the states, West Virginia, Kentucky, and so forth. They've spread out, but tend to spread out to the upper south and the Midwest, and the point I'd like to stress about that is, implicit in your book, they're a long way from the media centers of the East Coast and the West Coast. So we are talking about a distinctive culture of people who've been here for a couple of centuries that the rest of the country, the media culture in the rest of the country tends to overlook. Is that fair? I definitely think that's fair. The one caveat I would say is that though there is definitely a regional distinction and a, and a sort of cloistering of the Scots-Irish in a part of the country that is very cut off from the media centers of the country, I, I do think it's fair to say that Scots-Irish culture has been very, very influential on what we call American culture more broadly. So there's a really interesting book by a guy named Jeff Briggers, United States of Appalachia, which really chronicles the ways in which Appalachian culture is very, very influential on mainstream American culture. And, you know, I, I think that's, that's, remain, that, that's still true today. So there's still a sense in which what a lot of the things that we think of as American are at least somewhat related and influenced by Scots-Irish culture. Obviously, a lot of other cultures, too. But I do think Scots-Irish culture plays a pretty big part. Okay. They break through at the national level with Andrew Jackson. That's right. He's a Scots-Irish president. That's right. And we'll come back to politics in a moment. First, your family. The move from Jackson, Kentucky, which is Appalachia proper, yeah. to Middleton, Ohio, why? Well, um, for very, very stark economic reasons. So this is the 1940s. This is before especially generous social welfare programs. And I think at a very stark level, if my grandparents hadn't moved from Jackson, Kentucky, they faced a choice, right? Poverty, potentially starvation, maybe scraping by a relatively successful life. But if they moved to the industrial powerhouses that were developing in the Rust Belt, what we now call the Rust Belt, but back then was the land of opportunity, right. they had an opportunity at the steel mill or at the paper mill to earn a decent middle-class livable wage. And so that's what brought not just them, but millions of others into those, those Midwestern factories. Okay, so, and yet you argue in, you argue, you describe, you're observing, you state that in Hillbilly Elegy, that when they moved to middle-class Ohio, they did not behave like middle-class Ohioans. They did not become suburban. Yeah, that's right. It took a while to really adapt to the cultural norms of Midwestern middle-class life. And one of the, the takeaways from the book is that culture is really sticky in a certain way, right. right? You don't just all of a sudden acquire material comfort and then all of the habits, all of the attitudes that you grew up with, you you know completely cast off. That's something my grandparents learned when they were integrating into 1950s nuclear family middle class life in Ohio. It's something I, of course, learned as an adult myself that you know culture is sort of sticky, so they did struggle to adjust in a certain way. All right, so here you are growing up in Middleton, Ohio. <clears throat> Your mother, this is painful to read, painful to discuss. She, she, uh, you said you counted 15 stepdads, quotation marks around the stepdads, husbands, boyfriends, and so forth, moved through her life and your life when you were still a child. Sure. And let me quote from Hillbilly Elegy. Our homes are a chaotic mess. We scream and yell at each other. At least one member of the family uses drugs. We don't study as children, and we don't make our kids study when we're parents. And that was your way of life until you were 13 or 14 years old or so. More or less, yeah. More or less. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. So, what and are the interesting... normal. 
It definitely struck me as normal. Um, and in fact, I would say the alternative struck me as abnormal, right? So when you know my, my aunt, uh, the same one who put the, the fire out on my grandfather, when she married my Uncle Dan, I remember, you know, and I, I love these people very much, we're all very close, I remember thinking that his extended family was odd because they were so nice to each other. They didn't bicker and fight at Christmas and Thanksgiving. They didn't talk bad about each other behind their backs. And because of that, I thought that they were a little bit weird. So that there definitely was a sense in which the family environment that I grew up around, which was very foreign and very chaotic to you know, sort of upper class American mindset, was very normal to me. All right, let's stick with your life story for a moment sure. longer. When you're about 15, you stopped moving from home to home to home with your mother and moved in with your grandmother, Mama. Sure. This same woman who doused your grandfather with lighter fluid and tossed a match on him. Sure. Once again from Hillbilly Elegy, those three years with Mama, uninterrupted and alone, saved me. She was uneducated, she swore like a sailor, and she could be dangerous. How did she save you? Well, the, the part of my grandma that would you know, potentially set somebody on fire if they crossed her, it ha had had a good side too, right? Um, so, or at least a, a partially good side. So, you know, I was like a lot of kids who grew up in this environment. I was very close to, you know, I, I was not doing especially well at school. I was starting to experiment with drugs and alcohol. I was starting to hang out with the proverbial wrong crowd. And I remember when I was a kid, not quite 15, probably 12 or 13, and my grandma, even though I wasn't living with her 100% of the time, I still spent a lot of time with her. She still had a big influence in my life. I remember I started hanging out with this kid who was sort of known to be a local druggie, and my grandma found out, and she leaned in and said, JD, I wanna tell you something. If you don't stop hanging out with that kid, I'm gonna run him over with my car, and no one is ever gonna find out. Now, do I think that Mamma, in hindsight, would have actually ran over a 13-year-old kid? Absolutely not. But well, she you was... know, as a reader of your book, <laughs> I'm not so sure. But yeah, but Mamaw was always very protective of kids, and I think in her own way she probably felt very bad for him. But what she did believe, and what I believed, is that she would enforce that rule. She knew that I thought she would enforce that rule, and so when she made that promise, unlike a lot of kids who grew up in that circumstance who would say, ah, oh, screw it, I'm gonna hang out with the bad kid in secret, or maybe just ignore what my parents say, I believed her, and so I completely cut off contact with that kid. There were a lot of little things like that where my grandma provided some, you know, whether it was discipline or whether it was stability in the home. Standards that just gave also me, reading. Of she, course, she she expected you to do your homework, to behave, and if you didn't, she was going to come after you. No, that's absolutely right. She was she was very hard on me in a way that I needed. She demanded that I get. A, a job, that I work hard on the job, that I pay my own way. She demanded that I go to school and that I get good grades. You know, she she had, by the time that I lived with Mamaw, that was probably the poorest I ever was growing up. We had very, very little money. Uh, I remember that she went and bought a TI-89 graphing calculator because I was in the advanced math class at school. That was the hot calculator that at that stage. That was the hot calculator right. at that stage, exactly. and exactly, and Mamaw said, look, you lazy bastard. If I can pay for this calculator with as little money as I have, then you are gonna work hard in school, you're gonna do well. And that meant something to me, that really meant a lot. And so I did, in a lot of different ways, she had this influence on me that really set me on the right path. Again, we'll continue with your story here. I wanna get back to your people, so to sure. speak, but your story, because here you sit, beautifully articulate, wonderfully well-groomed, high-flying young man at a to tell uh, my wife capital that. management. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in writing. I'll put it in writing. So, briefly, how you got from there to here, so to speak. After high school, United States Marine Corps, right. which, which, which meant what to you? Well, it meant that it was an organization to me that had really high standards and that had a certain place in American history. Two of, you know, in my generation of grandkids, there were six of us, three of us joined the Marine Corps two of my older cousins, and both of them encouraged me to join the Marines, especially my cousin Rachel, who I'm, I'm very close to. So it was a big part of just getting out and seeing the world, learning certain standards, and also being exposed to certain values that the Marine Corps had, certain educational um, traits that I didn't acquire when I was a kid. The Marine Corps really instilled those things and gave me a, a lot of opportunities because of it. And then Ohio State, and then Yale Law School. In Hillbilly Elegy, you write, well, look, 
I won't quote you. Let you. I'll let you do. Since I sure. have you right here, just tell about <laughs> tell what it was like to hear your classmates talk about the armed forces of the United States when you had just served in the Marines. Well, I, so I, I should say that most of my classmates were, you know, very good people, and and if they were, you know, if they were unfamiliar with the military, which a lot of them were, they at least thought it was a curiosity, not a negative curiosity. They were just, you know, they wanted to know what was it like. They didn't know many people who had served before. So there was definitely an element of that. You know, some people were a little bit more hostile to military service and to those in the military. I think that came from not really knowing anyone who served. So Boy, I, are you cutting them a lot of slack. Well, I, I, I'm, the reason I'm cutting them a lot of slack is because most of them really were good people. And, and, I, and I don't want to give the wrong impression that, you know, I had a couple of, of bad experiences. And this is something that um, a lot of people, you know, not to get too political, but a lot of people on the left, I think, will take a couple of bad apples and say, well, right, the whole right. group is bad. And so I want, to, I want to resist that. But definitely there were some people who were very so, here's the Here's the feeling I get. Correct me if I'm wrong. The feeling I get is that when you move from Middleton, Ohio, into the United States Marine Corps, you are not moving from one world into a completely foreign world. The United States Marine Corps had enough um, continuity with the best of the tradition in which you grew up. These people are patriotic, they understand the importance of hard work. What the Marine Corps gave you was standards. Right. It forced you to perform, but it didn't seem, as I read Hillbilly Elegy, a really foreign world to you. That's right. When you moved to Yale, you were on another planet. Is that fair, or am I overstating it? Oh, that, that's, that's absolutely fair. I mean, you have to think demographically the Marine Corps was not all that dissimilar. You know, the Marine Corps is very racially diverse, but in terms of experiences, in terms of income classes, it's primarily middle-income, working-class kids. It's not kids who are especially poor or especially wealthy. So there was a sense in which the experiences of the kids in the Marine Corps was very similar to my own. That wasn't true at Yale Law School. <laughs> okay, all right. Immigrants to new countries... I knew this. Uh, there were some immigrants when I was growing up for, who were all kinds of wistful talk about Italy in the old days, but also almost a certain sense of guilt. They'd left people behind. Sure. Do you feel any kind of strange sense of dislocation having... You are not a hillbilly anymore, J.D. <laughs> or if you are a hillbilly, you are the best. You make, you make Jed Clampett look like a piker. You're doing beautifully. <laughs> Yale Law School, San Francisco. Do you feel any strange sense of dislocation that you've left good people behind? Well, uh, let me say first, I, I do think I'm a hillbilly, and I think that if, if you think that I'm, I'm so different from hillbillies, then um, my, my sense is that you, know, you ought to give them just a little bit more credit, if I, if I okay. may say that. Sure. So, so a lot or of the you folks, less. Maybe or me less. Yeah, that's right. No. <laughs> so, so a lot of the folks that I, I grew up with, I think, would defy the stereotype in a lot of different ways, and hopefully I you know, sort of give, give credit to my to my people, though I'm sure, like you said, I maybe make them look a little bad in some ways. But, you know, my, my, my sense of whether I have a, a certain sense of survival's guilt or a certain remorse for having left, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, oh, really? I, 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 I definitely feel maybe it's just because of the way that I am or maybe it's because of the familial culture that I grew up in. I definitely feel that I owe people back home a lot more um, than I'm currently giving. And I don't know, you know, there are a number of different ways to get involved, and I've thought since the public publication of the book, what is the best way for me to really give back? But I definitely have this sense that I owe something to the folks back home, and I, I, I think that's a good thing. I think it's good to be attached to a community and to feel like you should be doing a little bit more. Maybe, you know, it comes along with some, some feeling of survivor's guilt, but I don't think that's an especially heavy burden to bear. Okay. I look forward to the J.D. Vance... Uh, scholarship for hillbillies <laughs> at, at Yale. So back to the people you left behind now. Alone among all American ethnic and demographic groups, working class whites in recent years have seen their lifespans get shorter. Sure. This is the most fundamental measure of well-being. Every other kind of American is living longer, and your people are dying sooner. Sure. They're also the most pessimistic people in America. I'm quoting Hillbillyology. Well over half of blacks, Latinos, and college-educated whites expect that their children will fare better economically than they have. Among working-class whites, only 44% share that expectation. Now, you provide a kind of a very disheartening survey. You go aspect by aspect by aspect of life among 
your people, and I just like to go down in a certain sense your list and have you explain how this came to be. Family violence and breakdown, quote, we didn't live a peaceful life in a small nuclear family. We lived a chaotic life in big groups of aunts, uncles, grandparents, and cousins, close quote. How come? Is that something where you can draw a straight line all the way back to the Scots Highlands, or is this something that's developed since, say, the Second World War? No, my, my, because my, things have gotten worse. That's what we know. Things sure. in one way or another have gotten worse in recent decades. Sure. So, so my sense is that that connection to the extended network of kin has always been there. That's something that maybe traces back to, to, to the Highlands. Um, but that a lot of the trends since the 1940s and 50s have taken that cultural impulse to the extended kin network and sort of warped it and produced a lot of bad consequences. So one, the geographic dislocation caused by a lot of people moving north, it sort of forced my parents out of that extended network and required them to live in a nuclear family, which is not, it's something they took at least a while to adjust to. The economic pressures that have been caused, or, or, or that, have, that have been caused by factory closures and the decline of the Rust Belt economy and so forth, I think that further buttressed these new nuclear families for people who weren't necessarily primed or trained to live in a nuclear family in the first place. And so I, I think that combination of the economic pressure placed on these families and the fact that for the first time in many generations they found themselves outside of the extended network of kin created a lot of family pressures that produced some of the things I write about okay. in the book. The collapse of religious practice, quote, in the middle of the Bible Belt, active church attendance is actually quite low, close quote. What yep. happened? How come? Uh, that's a good question. I, the, the causal mechanism there, I'm not totally sure of, of why this happened. At least one problem that I, that I think is very real is that Protestant evangelical Christianity has increasingly been practiced in megachurches, mm -hmm. and those megachurches are geographically confined to typically middle-income and upper-middle-income neighborhoods. So I think that one of the things that, ha that has happened is that the community church that existed in a lot of poor communities, also a lot of middle-class communities, has sort of consolidated towards the megachurch, which may be good in some ways, but it's definitely taken religious institutions out of the life of a lot of poor folks. Okay, the erosion of the work ethic. Quote, people talk about hard work all the time in places like Middletown. You can walk through a town where 30% of the young men work fewer than 20 hours a week and find not a single person aware of his own laziness. Close quote. Once again, explain that. Well, my, my guess is that there is a certain measure of hopelessness and a consequent lack of agency that sets into some of these areas. So if you think about this, in the 1970s, if you're a working class white person, you had a lot of confidence, and that confidence was well placed, that even if you only got a high school diploma, you were gonna be able to earn a middle class wage. In 30, 40 years, that supposition and that confidence has completely been pulled out from underneath you. So I think one of the consequences of that is that a lot of the people who assumed that they were going to be able to have those jobs sort of create an alternate explanation for why they don't have these jobs in the first place, right? So they're not working, but they have to, they in some ways have to create or reinforce that work ethic mindset that they developed over their entire lives even though they themselves are not necessarily living that work ethic. Okay, so these, this is also causation and history. It's so all this very is very hard, hard yeah, to yeah. tease out. Um, so you mentioned the 1970s. I think if you think back to the 1870s, or for that matter, the 1770s, if you drive in the back country, the hill country of North Carolina, I mentioned that just because uh, I'm familiar with that. Sure. You can't turn a corner on some dirt road and not find some remarkably small piece of land that obviously used to be farmed, mm -hmm. or some little, in other words, it's not as if this is a lazy or shiftless culture. Those people worked hard mm -hmm. to, f to survive on that land for a couple of centuries before they started moving out, to do the coal mining they did. This was hard physical labor. So your contention is that at least a large component of what's taking place now is not that a culture of laziness has taken over. It's just that there's not work to do in the same way. Well, that, that's an important Hard, part of it. Right? But, I, but I think in the face of the absence of the work to actually do, people have to deal with that psychologically, right? right, right and right. I think one of the ways that they've dealt with it psychologically is to sort of give up, to say that no matter how hard they work, no matter how 
you know, much they do to try to get ahead, it's not actually going to produce good, good consequences. Now, that's partially true, of course, in an economy where there aren't as many good middle-class wages, but it's also very self-destructive. And so one of the things I try to hit upon in the book is that these attitudes can simultaneously be right, but also self-destructive, and we have to strike a better balance as a community in the white working class between those two very real prospects. Okay, welfare dependency. You, wrote, you write when you were working at a grocery store, quote, I learned how people game the welfare system. They'd buy packs of soda with food stamps and then sell them at a discount, discount for cash. Most of us worked hard, but a large minority was content to live off the dole, close quote. So have we, have we come upon a large explanatory factor here that people can get bought? So here's the question. Sure. This is all very, I mean, I'm doing, this is it's such a simplistic, you, you lean over and slap me if you want to, because I'm talking about your family and friends here. <laughs> but good Lord, 200 years ago, they had the, the gumption, the courage to get up and leave the Scots Highlands or Northern Ireland and come to this country they know how to get out and start over again. They've done it again and again across the generations. And now suddenly they're stuck. Yeah. Um, what explains that stuckness? And part of it is part of it that now the government picks up the tab for a lot of it. Let's, gives them just enough to keep them in place and dependent. Yeah, it's very complicated, right? So part, <laughs> okay, you won't go part, for that. Part, part, part of it is the I lack. I you say you know you're right. <laughs> Part of it is the lack of jobs. Part of it is, is the despair and the hopelessness that sets in because of the lack of jobs. But part of it is, I think, the fact that the government anti-poverty programs that we have are designed for a different time and a different purpose. What is the purpose of the 1960s Great Society? Whether you think it's good or whether you think it's bad, it is fundamentally to provide subsistence. It's so that people don't starve to death, so that basic needs don't go unmet. That, I think, is a valuable purpose and a valuable thing that government could be doing. But we also have to recognize that when the government does that, it can also provide disincentives and reasons not to work. It can do things that make it harder to become self-sufficient. So my sense is not that the government has sort of caused this problem and therefore we should completely pull away a lot of these programs. My sense is that we should recognize that the government has had a role in playing a part in these problems, and so that we should be thinking about how to create a social safety net that is geared more towards work and towards participating in some of these institutions of society. Because if we don't do that, we're gonna be, you know, I think we're gonna be continuing on the same path we have for the past 30 years, and it's just not working. Okay, this brings us to you. You are conservative, politically conservative. You write, I, I, I think you have to accept that title because you write for National Review. That's, that's right. When you're not when you're not scouting companies for mithril. <laughs> and yet, through this whole conversation, you've been extremely moderate and balanced, and well, there's, a, there's some of this, and there's some of this, and um, I am looking for the firebrand. I'm looking for mamma in you <laughs> when it comes to politics. I haven't seen it. Why are you conservative? Well, so I, I think that... Don't you, don't you feel the <laughs> urge to take some lighter fluid and, and, and squirt it over some of these welfare programs and <laughs> toss on a torch, you know? Uh, sometimes I feel the urge to do it, but I, I think that the, the best part of conservatism is maybe it's moderation. I don't think that moderation and conservatism are at war. I certainly don't think that, you know, Burke or uh, Russell Kirk would think that they're, they're totally at war. I mean, so, so I'm a conservative for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, I recognized growing up and I continue to recognize now that these people who I really care about a lot and I want to have better opportunities, that a lot of things the government has done have either not been super helpful or have even been counterproductive. Um, again, that doesn't mean that you should completely eliminate these programs, but I do think that it means that we have to you know, think about the social safety net with much different goals in mind because the past 50 years worth of goals hasn't necessarily worked. The second reason that I'm a conservative is that People on the left, I think, you know, and I'm, I'm going to paint with a broad brush, I don't think this is true of all liberals, but liberals tend to have a certain discomfort with talking about actors other than the state and other than the individual. If you read this book, the theme that runs throughout it is that family is an important actor, that community is an important actor, that neighborhoods, that churches are important actors. And so that's a long way of saying that culture matters in a way that is distinct from the way that individuals act and the way that the state acts. And conservatives seem to be much more comfortable in recognizing that and dealing with it in the way they approach public policy. Okay, 
So Kevin, that's a long answer. That, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that one more time okay. and take another run at you, JD. In the <laughs> first, though, Kevin Williamson, your colleague at National Review, this is, this is a long passage, but he wrote this in part in response to hillbilly elegy. It's a long passage, but it's worth quoting. Sure. You know what's coming. This is Kevin Williamson. If you spend time in upstate New York, where I happen to grow up, sure. or eastern Kentucky, where you grew up, or west Texas, where Kevin grew up, and you take an honest look at the welfare dependency, the drug and alcohol addiction, the family honor anarchy, you will come to an awful realization. It wasn't Beijing. It wasn't even Washington, as bad as Washington can be. It wasn't immigrants from Mexico. Nothing happened to working class whites. Nobody did this to them. They failed themselves. The truth about these dysfunctional, downscale communities is that they deserve to die. The white, not the people, the communities, the white American underclass is in thrall to a vicious, selfish, selfish culture whose main products are misery and used heroin needles. What they need isn't Donald Trump, we'll come to him. They need real opportunity, which means that they need a U-Haul. If you want to live better, get out. Well, that's fair. It's powerful. If, if their ancestors were able to move from the Scots Highlands to West Virginia, what's to keep folks from leaving Middleton, Ohio for Austin, Texas? or for Tallahassee, Florida. Go someplace where there are jobs and opportunity, for goodness sake. Don't use booze and heroin in Middleton. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm maybe gonna take the coward. A, oh, no, 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 <laughs> this, gonna, is where, I, this is where I want the yeah, lighter fluid. Well, I'm, I, so, Spread so it all I, over this argument. I, I'm gonna take the, the coward's response to this argument, which is to, to hide behind complexity, but I also think it's the true response to this argument. So what Kevin is talking about, though I wouldn't say it as strongly as Kevin does, there is an element of truth to it. If you look at this problem and you're trying to figure out how much of it is what Kevin's writing about there, how much of it is sort of individual moral failing, that has to be part of the conversation. It's one of the reasons I say in the book, look, government policy can help, but at the end of the day, we have to have a role in fixing some of these problems. Where I disagree with Kevin and where I think he's, he's being a little unfair is that th there were things that happened to these communities. I mean, there, there are a lot of good economics papers that have come out in the past few years that show that, for example, the areas of the country that were most exposed to free trade are the very areas where you have rising mortality rates, rising heroin rates, in particular and increasing trade from jobless China. Right. Okay. Yeah, right. Particularly trade from China. Right. So there, there is a sense in which globalization, maybe it's net good, but has been very, very hard on these communities. And at, at, a, at a more personal level, I, I think it's very easy to sort of take a step back, look at these behaviors in the abstract and say, look, there, there are clearly a lot of individual moral failings here. But I always bring it back to myself, and I think about myself when I was 14 years old and I was nearly one of those people that Kevin writes about. I was nearly one of those people who really gave up on myself. Why I was giving up on myself is ultimately very, very complicated. And part of it's what Kevin's writing about, but part, a lot of it is, is a lot of other things too. And we've got to recognize both that Kevin is partially right, but that there, are, there are other things happening. Okay. We're recording this not quite two weeks before the election. All the polls show <laughs> that Donald Trump is losing in every ethnic group. I think that is literally the case. Every ethnic group, Asians, Latinos, African Americans, college educated whites, but he's winning in one. The Scots-Irish, your people. Sure. Your people who are poor and having a hard time and located in Appalachia and the upper Midwest and the upper South, I beg your pardon, the Midwest and the upper South, have fallen in love with a billionaire from New York City. You explain that, would you please? <laughs> uh, I'll try my best. You know, so, so I, I think there, there are two things that are happening here with Trump. One is that the tone and the way that he conducts himself in politics, people are just sick of hearing people 
whether it's Hillary Clinton or Mitt Romney or Barack Obama, who are so unfamiliar and unrelatable. The way they talk about politics, how filtered and clean their accents are, there's something about Trump's offensiveness, something about his brashness that is appealing to, you know, the, to the people who I, I write about in the book, the people who grew up like I did. I mean, I even feel, and I'm not a Trump supporter, but I even feel a certain attachment and, a, you know, I, I get a little bit cheery when he says certain things on the campaign trail, when he criticizes the elites in such strong language. It's a little refreshing, even if you disagree with the substance of the remarks. The other thing that, that is true about Donald Trump is, look, as I write he about went the book, to a fancy Ivy League school and did not assimilate. He did. He apparently did not assimilate at all. <laughs> um, but but the other thing about Trump, and this is you know where you I, mean, I when think you run for office, you're going to have to unassimilate oh a notch or two. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Back to Trump. Back to Trump. Um, but but you look at this. You look at the substance of what Trump is going after. Um, the people in this book are obviously struggling in a very, very profound way. And it's not just an economic struggle, right? It's the addiction. It's the family breakdown. It's Actually, the rising I, mortality. You say Please. it's not just an economic struggle. As a matter of fact, I was struck at several points. You write, and I'm sure it felt this way, and I'm sure at some sort of objective level it's true that you were poor. Even when you said with your grandmother, the poorest moment in your life, when she sure. had very little money, but she was still able to afford a calculator. Yeah. Everybody had a television. Yep. Everybody had a house. You write that uh, diabetes, obesity is a problem. Mm -hmm. This is the, the, let's just put it this way. Poor people who are overweight is not poor as it has been understood in human history for, That's right. for millennia, right? That's so, right. So in some basic way, it's not poverty as poverty has historically been understood. It really is social pathology. It is a failed or sick or maladjusted approach to life. That's the real problem. Well, that's definitely, again, that, that's definitely a, a big part of the problem. And it's true, right? It's not that people are starving to death. It's that they're typically eating foods that cause diabetes and obesity. Right. That's a different problem from material deprivation. Right. There is still, you know, there, deprivation is, of course, all relative. And I think it's a fundamental flaw of the human condition. Well, they, so, so part of it, excuse me, again, why not? I'll just go back and forth with you a little bit. So that, that I made this point a little bit earlier about how this, here they are in the middle, eastern middle of the country, from the Appalachian Mountains over to Ohio and upper Alabama and so forth. And that's a long way from New York City and Washington and Los Angeles and San Francisco, the media centers. And I couldn't help feeling over and over again, reading Hillbilly Elegy, that part of the sort of subterranean anger, discontent, is they feel left out overlooked and left out. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And that that, that was actually going to be, you know, the other part of the, okay. the the answer to the to the Trump question is is look, you know, things have not been going well for the past 30 years. It's not just the economic stuff. It's not just material deprivation deprivation. It's also partially a feeling that the coastal elites, the people who have financial and political power, look down on people like you. And for the past 30 years, the Republican Party has basically run the same candidate right? You look at that stage, you think about the debate stage where there were 17 people on that stage and all 16 of them were fundamentally running a campaign, not at all that dissimilar from the one that George W. Bush, John McCain, and Mitt Romney ran. And every single one of them lost to the one guy who was saying, look, we're going to blow the whole thing up. I've had Everything it. that the elites have been telling you is wrong. This is why your life sucks. We're going to go in a new di direction politically, tonally, substantively. And that's appealing, I think, to a group of people who feel left out, but also feel a little bit left behind in the way that their lives are going. So Trump really tapped into that. Um, now, by the way, yeah. so they feel a resentment toward the elites who they feel are looking down on them. You now, having switched teams. I haven't switched teams. What, what, okay, good. You won't <laughs> let me get away with that. But let's put it this way. You are capable of, of judging for yourself the way elites actually, were they sure. right about the elites? Here you move in fancy San Francisco, Yale Law degree, do the elites look down on them? Or was this just another mistaken, sort of self-indulgent, self-pitying attitude of your, I, your I, people? I, I think they're, they're partially right, definitely. Um, you look at the, the attitudes of the elites, you know, people who I know who are very well educated, who typically have pretty sophisticated attitudes about politics, will talk about Trump supporters as if they are just, you know, Donald Trump is the dumb, redneck candidate that these dumb racist rednecks deserved all along and who they've wanted. There is a complete failure and you see it in the way that a lot of people in the elite media talk about Trump supporters. There's a complete failure to recognize 
that folks are fundamentally complicated and that they can be driven to vote for someone beyond just racism, right? It's so one-dimensional the way that they think of people that it proves in a lot of ways the very worst suppositions that my people have about the elites, which is that they don't really care about us, they don't try to think and understand us, they just judge us. And as much as I disagree with so many folks back home about Trump in particular, I think that the reaction of a lot of elites to Trumpism or the Trump voter feeds into the very worst narratives of how elites feel about okay. the rest of the country. Three last questions. Sure. What would you say to what would you say to your fellow conservatives? The polls now suggest, who knows? Who knows? There's still all, not quite two weeks to go. Sure. Donald Trump may pull it off. Who knows? We don't know that sitting here. Likely on the polls as they stand today that he will not pull it off. What do you say to your fellow conservatives about putting together a, a conservative party that says something to these people? Well, what, what I've, I would say is that we've, we've got to do better. Um, you know, I'm a conservative, but fundamentally for the past 30 years, the Republican Party has had very simple answers to the problems of its middle and working class base. And cut I don't think those, income tax rates. Cut, cut the top marginal rate, free trade, immigration, whether you think those ideas are good or bad, and I have my own views, they're not addressing the crisis that I write about in this book. So we've got to offer more to these people, or we shouldn't be surprised when they go for people like Trump. All right. And what do you say to Hillary Clinton? What do I say to Hillary Clinton? Oh, is she watching right now? <laughs> she actually is the least likely person to be watching this. But what would you say to Hillary Clinton? What I would say to Hillary Clinton is, if you really want to help the people that I'm writing about, and consequently, if you want to help make the country a little bit more culturally integrated than it is right now, you've got to do better than basket of deplorables, and you have to resist the very worst impulses of the elite, which after this election will be to sort of wipe their heads, say, woo, we got away with it, and look, those, those, we've got to deal with those dumb idiot Trump supporters, and if you, if you approach them like that, if you approach them as one-dimensional, then you're going to further drive a divide between them and the rest of the country. Okay. Last time I'm going to ask you to talk to somebody. Let's suppose that someplace in Jackson, Kentucky or Middleton, Ohio, there's a boy watching this interview whose father left when he was little, whose mother in and out of, is in and out of rehab, and so he's sitting in front of a computer screen with his grandmother down the hall in the kitchen making dinner. In other words, there's a boy coming up the way you came up. Sure. What does J.D. Vance want to say to that boy? Well, I would say to that boy the same thing that my mamma said to me, which is that, look, life is unfair for you. You are going to face barriers that other kids in similar situations don't have to face, but you still have control over your own life. Never be like those kids who think the deck is stacked against them. What your job is, is to recognize the unfairness, to overcome it, and then to give back once you've overcome it. And I think that's something that kids like me really need to hear, that even though the deck may be slightly stacked against you, you've still got to believe in your own agency or you're no, you'll, you'll never make it out alive. J.D., would you close this interview by reading a passage from Hillbilly Elegy? I will. I believe we hillbillies are the toughest goddamn people on this earth. But are we tough enough to do what needs to be done? Are we tough enough to look ourselves in the mirror and admit that our conduct harms our children? We don't need to live like the elites of California, New York, or Washington, D.C. We don't need to work 100 hours a week at law firms and investment banks. We don't need to socialize at cocktail parties. We do need to create a space for the JDs of the world to have a chance. I don't know what the answer is precisely, but I know it starts when we stop blaming Obama or Bush or faceless companies and ask ourselves what we can do to make things better. We hillbillies must wake the hell up. J.D. Vance author of Hillbilly Elegy, a memoir of family and culture in crisis. Thank you. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson. Mm -hmm.